And I calculate that at maximum warp sir, it would take over 300 years to get home. Okay, okay. So they've just jumped to the Triangulum Galaxy, so Messier 33, which they have just said is a distance that should have taken like 300 years for them to go at their, you know, normal like Star Trek warp drive speed. But with all that info, we can actually work out, okay, well then how fast is that normal warp drive speed of the, is it the Enterprise in the next generation? I don't know. <laughs> right, we can work out how much faster than light it can actually go. This is gonna be fun. Hello, sci-fi fans. We are once again reacting to Star Trek today, specifically the next generation, which I stand corrected from the last video I did on this. I've never seen any of the original Star Trek. TNG is apparently not the original Star Trek. There are a whole load of seasons before it and a whole load of seasons after it before you even get to the only bit of Star Trek that I've ever seen. The JJ Abrams films with him from Heroes as Spock. I know, I know, how did I become an astrophysicist with Without watching Star Trek. Many of my colleagues have asked me this in complete and utter disbelief before because so many of them were inspired into the field and into research by watching Star Trek. Obviously I just had a wasted youth listening to the Spice Girls. Anyway, thanks to two of my subscribers, John and Marianne, who suggested that I react to Star Trek The Next Generation Season 1 Episode 6, which is called When No One Has Gone Before. So let's dive into this without any further ado and start splitting the science from the fiction. Position, Mr. LaForge. Well, sir, according to these calculations, we've not only left our own galaxy, but passed through two others, ending up on the far side of Triangulum. And I calculate that at maximum warp, sir, it would take over 300 years to get home. Okay, okay, so they've just jumped to the Triangulum Galaxy, so Messier 33, which they have just said is a distance that should have taken like 300 years for them to go at their, you know, normal like Star Trek warp drive speed. But with all that info, we can actually work out, okay, well then how fast is that normal warp drive speed of the, is it the Enterprise in the next generation? I don't know. <laughs> right, we can work out how much faster than light it can actually go. This is gonna be fun. So it's just gonna be a simple like speed equals distance over time calculation, right? And we can look up like, first of all, like how far away like M33 is from the Milky Way because I mean, I'm assuming that Star Trek is set in the Milky Way, but correct me if I'm wrong, if it's actually like Star Wars and it's just in a galaxy far, far away <laughs> instead. Yeah, what distance have we traveled? 2,700,000 light years, sir. If you divide that by 300 years, then that gives a speed which is 9,000 times faster than the speed of light for the Enterprise's normal warp drive capabilities. Like, this is not possible under physics, right? We cannot go faster than the speed of light. And just to put this into perspective, like, even if you're traveling, at the speed of light in 300 years, you would only go 300 light years. You'd still be in sort of like the nearby star sort of vicinity of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. You would not have gone very far at all at the speed of light in just 300 years. This is just how mind-bogglingly space mind-bogglingly space, mind-bogglingly big space really is. So yeah, sure for us, light travels incredibly fast at around about 300,000 kilometers a second. But in the grand scheme of things, in terms of the scale of the universe, it's a pretty slow speed for how vast the universe is, which is why so many sci-fi shows bring in this idea of faster than light travel in some way or another, just so they can actually travel around the galaxy, or in this case, like, intergalactic travel. But faster than light speed travel definitely falls in the realms of fiction and not science, at least with our current understanding of the laws of physics. It's Einstein's theory of special relativity that tells us that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Because to accelerate something to that speed, you would need an infinite amount of energy, which you can never have, and so you can never reach that speed of light. Nothing can go faster than it. Now, having said that, there are technically some mathematical solutions to the equations of Einstein's theory of general relativity that say that, as, you know, something could appear to travel faster than the speed of light if it could somehow 
contract space in front of it and then sort of stretch it behind it, creating essentially a warp bubble, which would mean that it would actually appear to travel less distance than the true distance that separates those two points in space. The mass of this was actually published in 1994 by the Mexican theoretical physicist Miguel Alquivere. So that's well after like the first season of TNG aired. So that's kind of exciting to think that, okay, well then the maths came out to describe what could be happening, but it is still just maths on a piece of paper and it's not been achieved experimentally as of 2024 at least. <laughs> Stardate 41263.3. Instead of returning to our own galaxy, the Enterprise has gone forward to a place in the universe which is uncharted and unknown. Our okay, so <laughs> they've now ended up on the other side of the universe, apparently. Like, those are just crazy numbers and like ridiculous acts of like faster than, even faster than light speed travel, right? Quick aside from me as I edit this. So as I watch this back, I noticed that Picard actually said that they had gone a billion light years away to the edge of the universe. Our present position puts us at over a billion light years from our galaxy. I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense because the edge of the universe, the, edge of the observable universe anyway, is 13.7 billion light years at least in terms of look back time, if you correct for the expansion of the universe since then, it's more like 46 billion light years away. But then I realized this came out in like the 80s. So I was like, I better look up like, okay, how far was the most distant galaxy known back then? I went back to my recent video on the record breaker of the most distant galaxy known at various different points in history. And I worked out it was around about one and a half billion light years away. So them going with a round number of a billion light years is actually kind of right for 1987. And you could say, okay, well, this is like warp drive again, so they're just warping space. But, you know, the more you have to warp space, the more energy you would have to put in, which, you know, to travel 43 billion light years, like you're just so far out of the realms of what we think is scientifically possible, given our current understanding of the laws of physics. I really think the writers just threw science out of the window for plot on this episode. Especially when you also consider, like, the ship, the crew, like, everything and everyone seems mostly fine, right? Like, I'd like to see you yeet your car up to light speed and see if you and it hold together, right? Like, your car would just not be built for that kind of, like, acceleration and energy change. Also, what's gonna happen when they get back? And they've been travelling so fast that they've experienced time differently to all of the people, like their friends and family, that they've left behind, right? Time dilation is a thing. It's part of Einstein's theory of special relativity, that the faster you're going or the stronger gravity you're in, the less time you experience compared to someone who is stationary. So, you know, although for them it might feel like they've only been gone like a few hours, maybe a few days, like millions of years could have passed to the people that they've left behind because of how fast they're actually going. Like, I feel like time dilation is often one of those things that like sci-fi roaming you know, ship shows, Firefly, Star Trek, all that kind of stuff, you know, like they always forget about, except of course for Interstellar, where they very clearly knew about it, they discussed it and went, eh, it'll be fine anyway, we'll just spend an extra minute or two on this planet, screw that dude that we left behind on the ship, he can just get old. I've waited years. Now I know what you're thinking, I want to watch Star Trek, but it's not available in my country to stream. Well, what if there was something that could help with that, and keep you safe online, well that's what a VPN does, which is handy because this video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, which helps protect you and your private information online. Whenever you access the internet using an unprotected device, whether that's a phone or a laptop or a tablet, that device is sending out a huge amount of information which can be accessed by anybody on the same Wi-Fi network as you. So that could be your location or your credit card information or even just like private messages. Using the internet without a VPN is like leaving your phone unlocked and unattended so that anyone can just pick it up. But private internet access helps protect your personal data by encrypting your internet connection through their world-class server infrastructure, which helps shield your information from any hackers. So what's this got to do with Star Trek? Well, many website and content that's available on streaming services is only accessible depending on your physical location. Private internet access helps you overcome these restrictions by giving you the option to change your IP address to one of the 91 countries or any of the 50 US states, allowing you to get access to websites and services 
services that are only available in those locations, like the content available on the UK Netflix, including all seven series of Star Trek TNG. It's available on all platforms and you can now use just one private internet access account to protect an unlimited number of devices all at once. Look, there's no risk in trying out private internet access because they've got a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you click on the link in the description below, you'll get 83% off and an additional four months free on your subscription, which is an incredible deal for you all. So thank you so much to private internet access for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to reacting to Star Trek The Next Generation. Are we millions of light years away from where we were? Yes. But what got us here? Thought. Thought. Oh, if only it was as simple as using thoughts alone. Because remember how I was saying before that, like, there does theoretically exist, like, solutions to Einstein's equations that show that, like, this idea of a warp drive, like, might be possible? I mean, one of the many reasons that it hasn't been achieved experimentally is technically those solutions to the equations violate what's known as the energy condition, which essentially says that, like, the energy in a specific point in space can't be negative. Now, it's not necessarily like a physical condition, the energy condition, it's kind of more of like a common sense condition. There's nothing to say like in physics that it can't be negative. Because we also know that the accelerated expansion of the universe due to this thing that we call dark energy, that's exerting this negative pressure outwards, so a negative energy. So from those observations of the universe, that suggests that negative energy has to exist in some form, we just don't really understand what that necessarily would be. So, I mean, this traveler's thoughts would have to be creating negative energy to do these like faster than light speed warp drive jumps, whatever you want to call them. And I mean, I guess there is some energy associated with thoughts. Like I think I remember reading once that like the brain has enough electrical energy to power a low wattage light bulb. Of course, I don't think this traveler is necessarily human. Obviously what we're creating isn't negative energy, but they could be, you know, but as far as we know it, like there's no way for a being's consciousness or thoughts or anything like that to interact with space-time itself and warp it. Captain's log supplemental. Our position is unknown. Any time entry is meaningless. We have no choice but... Okay, so they've started noticing that time and space are behaving differently, and that's really interesting, right? The only places that we know that that happens are, like, regions of high gravity, so, like, around a black hole, for example, where you do get gravitational time dilation. Time slows down because gravity is so strong, like I was talking about before. But we wouldn't expect that to happen just because we're in, like, a different part of the universe, as long as that obviously wasn't, like, a, a massive object nearby. Like, we think the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe, the constants of physics are the same everywhere in the universe, so that, you know, the same physics that we calculate in the Milky Way would be true in Andromeda or on the other side of the observable universe. Having said that, there are some people looking at whether that's possible, like, whether, like, you know, gravitational constants can change and things like that. And if we allow those things to vary in our theories, does that help solve some problems that we have, like, what is dark energy that's causing the accelerated expansion of the universe? Or the crisis in cosmology, where you've got loads of different methods for calculating the current rate of expansion of the universe and they all don't agree. Right, that whole side of physics of like tweaking things in theories, especially in gravity, is called modified gravity. You essentially take Einstein's theory of general relativity and just tweak it a little bit to see if that fits the data better, essentially testing if Einstein was wrong. But as far as we know, Einstein's theory of general relativity is the best theory of gravity that we currently have. But if I was a sci-fi writer and I wanted to, you know, do something like this and have this kind of a plot point, I think I'd have fun writing in something about how, you know, general relativity wasn't quite right. And maybe actually it's a theory of modified gravity and that just tweaked things a little bit so that it made faster than light speed possible in this way. I think that would be a really fun way to sort of err on the side of science while still, you know, being able to actually have a fiction show with a plot. Or would you rather tell her about this, Wes? If you don't mind, sir, I'd like to sit here for a while. I'll tell her later. Oh, it's good. I 
I really enjoyed that one actually. Like, it really got me thinking. As I said, it was very firmly rooted on the fiction side of things, but that's kind of the point of sci fi, right? And it's fun to split out the science from the fiction. As I said, I think what happened in the writer's room for this episode is they were like, look, we know that faster than light speed and warp drive is actually quite limited in where it can take us. And they were like, you know, thought experiment. Um, what if there's like a magical creature that's like Gandalf that just turns up? Well, we don't have to explain like the laws of nature or magic that they're beholden to. It's just magic. And if they are magic, they can take the ship anywhere and we don't have to explain how or why. If we did that thought experiment, what would happen on the Enterprise? And I think that's how this episode was born. They just sort of like swept all the science under the rug for the drama. But that's kind of why we love sci-fi, right? Anyway, I hope you learned something in this video. That's kind of the whole point of these videos. And if there's any other sci-fi shows that you'd like to see me react to, and especially like specific episodes of sci-fi shows, that's really helpful when you give me a specific episode, let me know down in the comments below. But until next time, everybody, live long and prosper. Is it one hand? Two hands? I don't know. All I know is that I could do this as a kid and not everyone could and I was like, ha ha. <laughs> live long and prosper. <laughs> oh, these are filthy again. Ugh. Oh my god, I'm a bit need my uh, headphones out. I wear my headphones. Oh, they're still in my hand luggage from the other day. I'm back from holiday. I still haven't fully unpacked. I'm still like, what the frig time is it? I don't know. <laughs> Baby, I'm right here. I'm watching Star Trek. What do you what? Come say hi. Yeah. You don't need to cry out there. Come say hi. Come watch Star Trek with me and first of all find out how you pronounce Alcubierre's name, because I can't remember. Well, after Star Trek first aired, I think uh, 94 when was TNG? <laughs> mm. Experimentally achieved as of 2024 anyway. 2024? Who says that? 2024. Also, <coughs> sorry, voice went really high then.